What's up, Gary? Hi, John. That's John Brannion. I'm Gary Varvel, and this is Wise Fools, and we're welcoming you tonight and uh, reminding you that this is not the Bible study you want. It is the Bible study that you need. He speaks the truth. <laughs> Welcome to our uh, our fellow Bible sojourners, doctors here, uh, Ray's here. Ray. Appreciating, appreciating the virtual snacks being Dale provided. Dale Fiore. Dale's here. Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack wife. Uh, let's see. I saw some other. Christine's here. Hi, mm -hmm. Christine. And Jeff Lane. Um, that's all I see for now. There may be some other people lurking out there. They've got Welcome their own everybody. discussion going on before we even start here. That, that happens quite a bit. Yeah, um, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so we are uh, Genesis 27 tonight, and it's kind of long. Let's just it is go long. ahead. And, let's just go ahead and say that, so nobody is shocked. Um, forty-six verses, twenty-three 46. apiece. What's new in your I, life, John? Well, here's here's a thing that's new that I just discovered when yeah. the show was starting that we now have the ability to do background music. Listen to this. Can you hear that? Yeah. Cool. And... All right. Is that appropriate so, uh, for Bible study? <laughs> So if somebody says something really off the wall, then you jump in with some background music to kind of yeah, I, I just discovered, drown them out. Yeah, I just discovered it. I'm, I'm not sure how useful this is. Here's one called Feeding the Ducks. That make you... <laughs> anyway. It sounds a little too hip for us, John. It sounds a little too, it sounds a little too mellow for ducks. Yeah, it does. Me. <laughs> hey, um... If you hear anything in the background, it's because uh, we are babysitting the grands tonight. We have four of them, and the twins are in bed. The twins are in bed, but they and they're twenty months. But they are. Uh, I heard them a while ago. They have a hard time getting started, but once they sleep, they'll sleep. You know, until six in the morning. But uh, yeah, I tell you what. <laughs> so do they sleep in the same? Do they sleep in the same yeah. uh, proximity to one another? It, they're close, but they're separated by, you know, they're in cages. We have uh -huh. kids in cages here. <laughs> you got to. When they're 20 months yeah. old, they, you yeah. have to put them in cages. Yeah. Um, so they're just so busy. I mean, and you got two of them, yeah. and they're just running. like. And so it's, yeah. Yeah. I didn't get anything done today. <laughs> it's exhausting. It is exhausting. exhausting. There's a reason why you're young when you have children, because you just can't. It's, it's wild. So I know that there's the an twins eight. and then two others. You have four. Yes. Yeah. Two? The other two are 10 and uh, seven, I think. 10 and seven, I think. They can be some uh, help with the twins, they, right? They are a little bit, but, you know, they got their own. They got their own agenda, too. But it's been logo. yesterday. Yesterday, because it was sunny outside, we had fun. We went out and we shot some baskets, and you know they rode the bikes. And but today was too cold to go out. It was thirty six. Yeah. So yeah, too cold. Well, it was. It's been a little more peaceful around my house today than it's been around your house. I haven't had any grandkids yeah, yeah. invading today. So. I don't anticipate anything because uh, my wife has them in another room and they're playing some board game. So that'll keep them busy. What are they playing? Do you know? Uh, no, I don't. They came in and picked one out, but oh, I don't okay. know what it is. Sorry. All right. Well, go find out. We'll wait. <laughs> no, uh, okay. no. Let, let's just All go right. ahead and get into this. All right. Uh, Genesis 27. 27. You want Shall to take I begin? The first? Yeah. I'll take the first 23. All right. All right. Genesis 27, verse 1. One day when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, his oldest son, and said, 
My son? Yes, father, Esau replied. I am o I'm an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and your quiver full of arrows and go out to the open country and hunt some wild game for me. Uh, prepare my favorite dish and bring it here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. But Rebekah overheard what Isaac said uh, to his son Esau. So when Esau left to hunt for wild game, she said to her son Jacob, Listen, I overheard your father say to Esau, Bring me some wild game and prepare a delicious meal, and I will bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you. Go out to the flocks and bring me two fine young goats. I'll use them to prepare your father's favorite dish. Then take the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm smooth. And my skin is smooth. What if my father touches me? He'll see that I'm trying to play a trick uh, tr trying to trick him, and then he'll curse me instead of blessing me. But his mother replied, Then let the curse fall on me, my son. Just do as I tell you. Go out and get the goats for me. So Jacob went out and got the young goats for his mother. Rebekah took them, prepared a delicious meal, just the way Isaac liked it. Then she took Esau's favorite clothes, which were in the house, and gave them to her son, Jacob. She covered his arms in smooth and smooth part of his neck with the skin of young goats. And then she gave Jacob the delicious meal and included some <laughs> freshly baked bread. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, he said. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? Jacob replied, it's Esau, your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here is the wild game. Now sit up and eat so you can give me your blessing. Isaac asked, how did you find it so quickly, my son? Uh, the Lord your God put it in my path, Jacob replied. Mm -hmm. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you are really Esau. So Jacob went closer so his father uh, Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, uh, Isaac said. But he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy, just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared uh, to bless Jacob. But uh, are you really my son, Esau, he asked. Yes, I am, Jacob replied. Uh, then Isaac said, now my son, bring me the wild game. Let me eat it, and then I will give you my blessing. So Jacob took the food to his father, uh, and Isaac ate it. He also drank the wine that Jacob served him. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come a little closer and kiss me, my son. So Jacob went over and kissed him, and when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he was finally convinced, and he blessed his son. He said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the outdoors, which the Lord has blessed. From the dew of heaven and the richness of the earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May many nations become your servants and may they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. All who curse you will be cursed and all who bless you will be blessed. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and almost before Jacob had left his father, Esau returned from the hunt. Es uh, Esau prepared a delicious meal and brought it to his father. Then he said, sit up, my father, and eat my wild game so you can give me your blessing. But Isaac asked him, who are you? Esau replied, it's your son, your firstborn son, Esau. Then Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably and said, Then who just served me wild game? I've already eaten it, and I blessed him just before you came. And yes, that blessing must stand. When Esau heard his father's words, he let out a bitter cry. Oh, my father, what about me? Bless me too, he begged. But Isaac said, Your brother was here and tricked me. He has taken away your blessing. Esau exclaimed, No wonder his name is Jacob, for now he has cheated me twice. First he took my rights as the firstborn, and now he has stolen my blessing. Oh, haven't you even saved one blessing for me? Isaac said to Esau, I have made Jacob your master, and have declared that all his brothers will be his servants. I have guaranteed him an abundance of grain and wine. What is left for me to give you, my son? Esau pleaded, but do you have only one blessing? 
Oh, my father, bless me too. Then Esau broke down and wept. Finally, his father Isaac said to him, You will live away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of the heaven above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But, but when you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from around your neck. From that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme, I will soon be mourning my father's death, then I will kill my brother Jacob. But Rebekah heard about Esau's plans, so she sent Jacob and told him, listen, Esau is consoling himself by plotting to kill you. So listen carefully, uh, listen carefully, my son, get ready and flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay there with him until your brother cools off. When he calms down and forgets what you have done to him, I will send you, uh, I will send for you to come back. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm sick and tired of these local Hittite women. I would rather die than see Jacob marry one of them. All right. <laughs> that's, that's... <laughs> And a, sort of an abrupt it's, ending to that, isn't it? It is an abrupt ending, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I don't know any Hittite I'm, women. They must I'm have been terrible. Sick of these Hittites. <laughs> Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for this chapter, and I pray that you'd help us as we discuss it tonight, help us to learn from it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, mm. there's a lot of stuff here. There's uh, a lot of stuff. Interesting story. Now, I read somewhere that Martin Luther said that at this time, Isaac is like 137 years old. Uh, I don't know. but Could And be. then he ends up dying he's, at like 180, I think. He's not real uh, perceptive. His, most of, most of his, uh, his senses have left him at this point. That's why yeah. he, uh, he so, isn't yeah, able to so, differentiate between his sons. <clears throat> They didn't have eyeglasses back then, no. and he couldn't see. But if he's 137, and he thinks he's about to die, so he wants to get the blessing and, and do that now. But he mm -hmm. lives to be 180, uh, which is an interesting thing. Uh, so yeah, Another, what, then, 43 years? Yeah, 43 years. Um, so that's – but, you know, he was – he was old and he was losing his sight, and you never know when you're going to die. But one of the things that strikes me, John, mm -hmm. is that they, especially Esau, acts like this blessing is just a physical blessing, just for goods, just for stuff, you know. And this is actually supposed to be a spiritual blessing. And the blessing was promised to Jacob, who was the second born. These guys mm -hmm. are twins. He was the second born. And God told Rebecca that the younger, the older will serve the younger, that the blessing is supposed to go to Jacob. Right. And uh, so what they tried to, they, and I think that Isaac would have had to have known this, right? But Isaac's favorite was Esau. You should never have a favorite. If you have multiple children, you should not have a favorite. Because it, as we see in the case of Jacob later on, he has a favorite, and the other children, they hate the favorite. His favorite was Joseph. Right. And so, anyway, um, let's stay with this story here. Isaac would have had to known that the blessing, God had already called it. And yet he was going to try to usurp that and, and go around the Lord and do it in the natural form. Uh, he tells Esau privately, uh, and Rebecca overhears it. Mm -hmm. And so then she gets it in her mind that in the flesh, we're going to, you know, God already promised, so we're going to make this work our way. And so they get, they work up this deceptive plan. The question right. is, God had already determined it. So if they'd have done nothing, whatever Isaac would have done would have been null and void because God had already called it. And as we saw, as we see here too, Esau had pretty much, he, he gave up his birthright for a, a, pot, a pot of stew, right? Right. Then he goes and marries a couple of Hittite women, not just one, but two of them. Mm 
yeah. they made mm-hmm. Isaac and Rebecca miserable. Mm-hmm. It's like he did. It's like almost like he was a rebellious son who just did everything that against the Lord. You know, I'm going to do my own thing. And God wasn't pleased with that. And God, before they were born, God, God or chose Jacob. And I think God knows the future, obviously. He knew what kind of guy he was going to be. Uh, in fact, I, there's a verse in Hebrews chapter, where is it, 12 or no, 11? Hebrews chapter 11, I believe it is. If you could call that up, I think it's verses 15 and 16. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, that's what I'm looking for. What's 15 and 16 say? Uh, if they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. They were looking that's for a better it. place. A heavenly oh, homeland. No, that's not it. All right, here it is. It's Hebrews chapter 12, 15 through 17. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, okay. Hebrews chapter 12. I should have known. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of faith. That's the, and then chapter 12. Could you read verses 15 through 17 since I can't see? Look, look after each small. other. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no one poison, that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Uh, make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. Yeah, so uh, what's the message to us from just that? Um, we want, in this generation, we want immediate satisfaction. We, want, we don't like delayed gratification. We want it right now. Mm-hmm. And in the case of Esau, that's the way he was. He wanted, he wanted his food when he wanted it, and he didn't care about anything else. He, he mm-hmm. you know, instead of waiting... Uh, to, you know, maintain the birthright of being the firstborn, he just gave it up. Like for just a pot of stew, he didn't mean anything to him because the well, things of the Lord didn't mean anything to him. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was short-sighted. And yeah. that's, that's, it's never good to be short-sighted, to, to do a thing for the immediate satisfaction or gratification, whatever it brings about right now, because... Usually, you know, 10 minutes from now, you're going to go, gosh, that was that was not a good decision. I was rash. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so here we have Jacob, who's a deceiver, and that's kind of what his name means. He's a scoundrel. Mm -hmm. And yet God has chosen him. Now, he has a he wrestles with God in the future and and has a change. But God chooses who he chooses, and in, in this case, Jacob wanted the, the blessing. He wanted it. And Esau didn't want it earlier, but then when, you know, it came time for it, then he wanted it. He wanted to live like he, he wanted to live like he wanted to live until it was time for the blessing, then he wanted that too. Right. It was like he wanted his cake and eat it too. Instead of, you know, and I think some people could say, well, uh, I'm saved so I can just live like the devil. No, 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 that's not. If you're really truly saved, you won't li- want to live like the devil. You you want to be different than that. Well, I think, I I do think that Esau is a is a type. We, we've all, we all know somebody who's like Esau, where mm-hmm. they they just do rash things. They, they mm-hmm. just, they, they can't think an hour into the future. And so everything they do is based on how they're feeling at the moment. What is, what is it? What's going to make me happy at the moment? What's going to what's going to bring me satisfaction right now? Um, and Esau probably didn't save money. You know, he probably yeah, didn't. Yeah. He probably didn't uh, keep his his equipment sharpened up and everything like that. He probably just reacted to things 
Mm-hmm. It, it was his whole life. He did, he just reacted rather than rather than planning or or you know whatever. And so there, there's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people mm-hmm. who just don't think about what's going to happen tomorrow if I make a decision today, um, and they they don't think about how it's going to impact their their future. They don't think about how it's going to impact their family. That's a big one. A lot of people have no regard for the other people around them when they make a decision. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. they, they do a thing and then they're like Esau. They find themselves uh, begging and wailing with bitter tears, asking mm-hmm. for forgiveness, asking for somebody to, mm-hmm. you know, okay, oh, I'm so sorry for what I did. Will you, will you forgive me? And, and, and it's, it's a cycle that goes over and over and over again because they don't think about they don't think about what's going to happen after their decision. Right. right. Uh, Archie Gilmer makes a, a good point here that there's a little bit of Esau and Jacob and all of us. And, you know, hopefully we'll wrestle with God before it's too late and repent. And that's, that's true. You know, I think there is a deceiver in all of us. And there's also this selfish Esau inside of us who wants to do what we want to do. And, and we, put spiritual things on the back burner. Yeah. The question is, it, it is like, okay, let's say that Jacob and, and Rebecca don't get involved with this deception. And then Isaac goes through with blessing Esau. Mm-hmm. Just because he blesses Esau doesn't mean God has to go through with that because God had already d- determined that he was choosing Jacob. He, that's what he told Rebecca when she was pregnant, that that's what he mm-hmm. was going to do. So, no matter what Isaac would have said at that point, uh, it, it's it's a moot point. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, when he was done, you know, and so Isaac, when Esau shows up, you know, and Esau's begging, you know, isn't there any kind of blessing you give? And he basically said no. Uh, and that's, that's a tough one right there. Uh, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, but I have multiple children. I want to bless all three of them. Now, there's an interesting book written by Gary Smalley years ago, and I've read it, but it's been some time ago, called The Blessing. And he goes through the Bible and, and looks at uh, the blessings of uh, the patriarchs. Mm-hmm. And Jacob had, and he kind of focuses on Jacob's 12 sons, because Jacob, at the end of his life, he blesses each one of his sons. And of right. course, the, the blessing, the blessing, that the blessing of God goes to Judah, which is going to be in the line with the Messiah. But each one of those boys, and some of those boys, it it wasn't a good blessing that he no. gave them. It was no. not good. Right. Some uh, of them get get really really bad things. Um, yeah. yeah. It, they got some tough love, and uh, mm-hmm. but I think it's a, it's an interesting thing, you know. As far as um, I've heard some good things over the years, and I've tried to implement those as a, a father, and I had a good dad. But uh, one of the things every kid needs to hear is they need to hear, I love you. They need to hear, uh, I'm proud of you. That's another good thing to say to your kids. But I think the third thing that they need to hear is that they need to be encouraged in something that they're doing. You know, you're good at this. And you got to find that out and encourage them in that. Uh, I think it, kids are looking for uh, encouragement and acknowledgement from their parents. And when you pump that kind of courage into them, it gives them that kind of courage to do even more. Uh, if you're critical of them when they're trying, like say, you know, or my grandkids were drawing today. Well, I was, I was praising them all over. And they're pretty good for their age. They're very good. And, but I'm praising them because I want to encourage that. Now, if I'm critical, and I could have picked it apart if I wanted to, well, all of that does, that just, that crushes them and makes them not want to try. So you want to keep pushing them in, in, in doing and in trying more and getting better. And, and you can show them things along the way. But so I love you. I'm proud of you. And you're good at and it doesn't have to be drawing and be something else. But I think another thing that a parent needs to do is to study their children and see what their interests are. Now, Esau was a man of the outdoors. He wanted to go out and hunt and do all of that stuff. And Jacob was an inside guy. He liked staying inside. He had smooth skin. And he was mm-hmm. kind of a mama's boy, I guess. And so whatever their 
whatever their bent is toward, you try to encourage them in that kind of thing. Not that, right. not that Jacob was a girly man. I mean, he wrestled with God all night and ended up with a, you know, out of socket hip uh, because of it. So he, he was tough, uh, especially later on. Also, when he went to work for, we'll see it later on when he goes to work for his future father-in-law. Uh, he works a long time for that guy. That's hard labor, you know, shepherding mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, I think I think there's some there's some good points here, and I think Archie's right. There's a little bit of both of us, and what we want to do is encourage the spiritual and not the fleshly. Well, this story is pretty familiar to most people. This is this is one of the Sunday yeah. school stories that you learn when you're a little kid. <clears throat> This is mm -hmm. one that goes up on the flannel graph. Um, yeah. <laughs> and usually you, usually we focus on the deception, you know, of, uh, of Jacob, you know, they, where it's like he's, look, he's, he's tricking his dad. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't. And, and those are all those are all correct messages. But there's a lot of stuff going on in this story that you don't think about when you're a mm -hmm. little kid in Sunday school. Yeah. Um, like the first thing is that uh, Isaac is very suspicious. Um, you know, he's like, "Who's here?" And let me and let me, let me touch you, and then uh, mm -hmm. let me let me smell you. And it's not. It, I mean, even after Jacob says, "No, it's it's me, it's Esau," yeah. he's not convinced. And so right. Isaac's suspicious for a reason, right? Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he had to know. That, yes. that something was afoot, um, or he, he he had to know that there was there was a possibility at least that they were going to pull a fast one. That's the reason he was kept asking questions and and kept needing to touch him. Um, I think it's also so, possible that he also knew what in his trying to bless Esau he was <laughs> he was not doing what God wanted. I think that's right. it, and that's why he was like very cautious about him. Um, I don't want to bless the wrong one here. Everybody, everybody in this story is is at fault. It's not yes, just exactly. Jacob. It's right. not just Jacob. It's it's Rebecca, Rebecca, who, who didn't she, apparently tell Isaac that God had told her that Jacob was supposed to get, or if, or maybe she did, and he maybe and she he, did. That's the reason he was suspicious. Um, yeah, but, but something is going on that that's just not right. It, it doesn't, it doesn't go down smoothly because everybody is, is tricking stuff. You got Esau, who's obviously, like we said before, he has no regard for the birthright and no regard for the blessing. Right. He's just, right. just a completely, you know, loose cannon, selfish. Uh, and then of course you got Jacob who is, who is going in and deceiving, but every single one of them, not not a member of the family was actually uh, trusting God to work this right. out. Every right. every one of them was was doing was exerting their will into the story. Nobody was trusting God. You're right. They were all wrong, and Rebecca and Jacob were were wrong trying to do the right thing. Jacob was, uh, I mean, Isaac was wrong because he was trying to do the wrong thing, and because he. I think he had to know that God had already said that the blessing has to go to Jacob. He had to know that. Esau was wrong because he didn't care about the birthright before, and now right. all of a sudden he wants it. But I think he was wanting it because it came with material goods. You know, you got all kinds of stuff, and yeah. that's physical. That's that's the uh, the temporal instead of the spiritual in. Uh, now, the other thing that as a result of this, we have a family tiff that goes on for years and years because now mm -hmm. Jacob, you know, I'm afraid if your dad dies, he's going to kill you. So you need to leave, you know, go back to my old family and my, my brother's house and go work for them. So that's what he ends up doing. And of course, then he gets not just one, but two wives, but then I don't want to get ahead of the story. But so it, it splits Spoiler. up the family. And Jacob doesn't, he doesn't see his father again until after he's dead. Uh, and so he comes back for the funeral at some point. Right. Uh, it, it's a, really a tragic thing. It could have been, it could have been, 
I don't know if Esau would have ever gotten over it, even if you did. But what, what should have happened, Rebecca heard Isaac say this. She needed to go to, directly to him privately and say, the Lord said that Jacob is supposed to get the blessing. So what are you doing? But she didn't do that. She tried to trick him. And and they also used his blindness, you know, his onset of blindness as uh, a method of tricking him. So they're using his his um, um, his handicaps. His handicap. That's what his, the word I was looking for. He's his, looking his for his summer. handicap in order to to trick him. Mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah, this is uh, the the Jewish the Jewish family is getting off to a bad start here. Well, it's it's also interesting to me, and this maybe we we touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, but it's the same idea that that some things can't be undone, and some things once yeah. they're done, they're done, and yeah. that's a it's a crucial lesson, especially for children to learn, because if if they don't learn it when the when the stakes are low, when you're mm -hmm. when you're a child, and it's like you and you. You make some rash decision, and it's like, well, no, you said you weren't gonna. You said you didn't want to go to the movie, and so now we're not going to go to the movie. And it's like, but I changed my mind. It's like, no, no, yeah. you said it. You said it. And so, so if if you don't f force them to come to terms with that when the stakes are low, then mm -hmm. as they get older and the stakes are higher, they're not prepared to 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 be wise when they're making decisions. They don't yeah. they don't think yeah. th they don't learn to think through things. They, mm -hmm. they, if you, if you reward children for behaving rashly when they're little, then they become rash adults. They become rash, yeah. irresponsible, um, knee jerk, um, going off half cocked. They, bec they become people who just don't make wise decisions and, and they are not prepared for when they make a decision that can't be undone because they've yeah. been trained their whole life to go, oh, you know what? I, I I may make a mistake, but we'll just we'll just forget about it. We'll just undo it. We'll back up. I'll I'll take a mulligan, and uh, right. and go over. And it's it's not good for people to get used to taking mulligans because mulligans no. are not part of life. They right. some things can't be undone. That's one of the things I love about sports because then you have a situation happens, and then I didn't like the call, but the umpire's not going to change the call. The referee's not going to change that call. So you just you have to. And, and here's the thing, I've, I've played and I, I've let those things get to me and I've seen other players let those things get to me and you continue to play the game and you're still playing the last inning that that situation happened. You're still mad about that, which causes you, causes you to not play well in the next moment, you know. Right. And so you have to forget whatever happened there. And that's a good lesson for us in life. Something happens, we have a tiff or something. We need to get over that thing, and that's in the past. You can't undo it, just like you said, right. and you got to move on. Right. I, I've I've told people that before too. I you know I'm sorry that this happened. I'm sorry I did this, but there's nothing I can do to change it at this point. You know, right. other than apologize and ask you to forgive me. I I will not continue that going forward. But I can't I can't undo it. Right. Right. You can't. You, I can't give you the blessing. I already gave your blessing yes. to your brother. And yeah. so no matter how you beg and, and cry and no matter how bad you feel, that's it. It, 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 it does you not. Know, yeah. I'm reminded of this great story. And uh, I have one. I have two John Wooden books. One of them is uh, autobiography. And it's not an autobiography. He didn't write about himself. Somebody else wrote about him. But uh, in his book, it's basically like an interview with him. But he talks about how he ended up at UCLA. He was coaching at Indiana State, which at that time was a really small college. And it was a teacher's college. And his because he grew up in Martinsville and went to Purdue, he wanted to coach in the Big Ten. Minnesota was looking for a new coach. And so they contacted him. And then at the same time, UCLA contact, contacted him. Now, UCLA didn't even have their home gym. They played every game away. If you can imagine that, UCLA, but they didn't have any home games because their their practice gym wasn't big enough. So all their games are away. And uh, so he wanted to go to Minnesota, but Minnesota said, we want you to be our coach, but we want our 
the coach who's here right now, we want him to be on your staff as an assistant. And John Wooden said, I can't do that. No, I, I don't mind if he's, you know, somewhere in the department, but he can't be on the team. He can't be a part of the coaching staff because you'll have divided loyalties. I can't, we can't do that. And they said, okay, well, let us talk about it. And he said, well, I have another college who's interested. And I said, I can't keep them waiting forever. I have to give them a, a work. So they picked a day and a time, 6 p.m. If I don't, and so Wooden said, if I don't hear from you by 6 p.m., I'll know that the answer is no. And I'll, uh, you know, I'll probably accept, I'm going to accept the other job. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that day came, six o'clock came, nothing. So he calls UCLA and says, I'm your guy. He gets off the phone. His phone rings, and it's Minnesota. They said, yeah. we've had a blizzard up here, and we've been trying to get a hold of you, but the phone lines have been down. We want you to be here. We found another position for the, the coach, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. He, he told them, I've already given my word, and my dad taught me that my word is my bond, and I can't go back on it. Right. Even though he wanted to coach at Minnesota. Right. But he went to UCLA. And he coached there, I think, seven years, and they didn't have a gym. But in that seventh year, they went pretty deep into the, into the uh, NCAA tournament. And there was a young guy in New York who was seven feet tall, who was watching on TV and saw them and thought, I would love to play for that guy. And so that guy's name was Lou Alcindor, and, uh, who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So he, con so they somehow got contacted. They flew Lou Alcindor out to to L.A. and uh, he saw that they didn't have a gym. And he told the coach, he says, "I'd like to play for you, but I can't come to a place that doesn't have a home gym." And so John Wooden went to the board of trustees and said, "You have to build a gym for this guy." because he will completely change the whole basketball program. So they built Pauley Pavilion in order to get Lou Alcindor. And Lou Alcindor came there. And that was back when, the, as a freshman, you couldn't play on the varsity. You had to sit a year. And then as you played sophomore through senior year. And so they had the thing built, and then he came out and played from that point on. Of course, completely changed. And then they won 10, 10 championships. Is incredible. Uh, I think a record will never be broken again. Oh, because that's a long story. Uh, that's a great book by John Wooden. There's just so many cool things in that book. But I, and when I was teaching at art at Bethesda Christian School in the morning, there was several years where I would just read a passage from his book before we'd start the day. And I just was trying to, and I heard, I, I met one of my uh, former students some time ago, and he said, You know, I think about those stories every once in a while. Mm -hmm. because I would read them and they, and, I, and it locked in their brains. And, but you know, being a man of your word is, that's a rare thing these days. Well, it's, it is, it's always, um, not always, usually it is, it's something that's, that's minor. It's something that's a, it's a little bitty thing that, that most people, uh, would go, well, why did you, why, that's not a big deal, is it? I've had uh, a couple of times I have given my word that I would go and do a show at a particular place, um, mm -hmm. you know, some little rinky dink uh, show yeah. at a coffee house or something like that. And a friend of mm -hmm. mine would call up and say, hey, would you come and do a thing? Sure, I'll come and do it. Well, then, uh, there was there have been a couple of times when I've made arrangements to go be at a show, um, and then a, another person would call with an actual show, you know, that involved yeah. money yeah, and everything. Show. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and they would say, "Oh, we've got a we've got a big, you know, festival or whatever, and it's going to this is a date, and we'll fly you and we'll pay you and everything." Mm. And I've and and it and it would be a thing to where I could where I could call the person that I, who's my friend and I could say, Hey, I got a gig. Uh, I can't do your thing, but, but I gave my word that I was going to do this yeah. thing. And so it, it would be, um, it would, it would not be a big deal. It would be, 
mm-hmm. you know, my friend would, would, would easily go, oh yeah, well, you gotta go, you know, you gotta go to work. I, I get it. I understand. Um, but, but those are the little things that are, that's the test. You know, it's not, it's, it's rarely life or death. You know, it's rare. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, mm-hmm. Uh, it's always some right, little right. minor insignificant thing. And, but that's the test. That's the test. If you, yeah. cause it's not a minor thing. It, it has to do yeah. with your character. Yeah. It has to do with your integrity. Right. It has to do with right. your, with your trustworthy with trustworthiness mm-hmm. and your honesty. Mm-hmm. All of those things mm-hmm. are on the line when you make those little decisions. Yeah. And the earlier you can learn that lesson, the better, because, uh, yeah, if, if you start breaking your word, then people, I mean, you get a reputation for that. That's, that's terrible. And and another interesting story from John Wooden's book. Um, so the college players, there was a time when you couldn't dunk. So Lou Alcindor comes into college basketball and he's dunking over everybody. He's scoring all these points and people can't stop him from dunking. So the UCLA, I mean, the NCAA comes out with a rule, no dunking in college. Mm-hmm. You can't dunk. So Lou Alcindor goes to John Wooden and he complains. He says, coach, he said, this isn't fair. This is just directly toward me. This is a, a, a rule they came up with to stop me. And he said, and John Wooden leans back in his seat and says, Lou, he said, you know, I think that you can still probably score without dunking. And when you get back, when when you get in the NBA, you'll remember how to dunk. And so that is when Lou Alcindor developed developed the sky hook, this hook shot that nobody could block. And he became he got so good at it that that became his signature move. Mm-hmm. Had he would it, if they hadn't have forced him not to dunk, if they hadn't come up with the rule, would he have developed the sky hook? And that, you know, that's one of those questions you, nobody can answer. But one of the things I learned and what I try to tell my kids when I would read that story to them, I said, look, at some point in your life, you're going to have an adversity. Instead of pitching a fit about it and fussing about it, how, how about let's figure out how I can work, or, work around this, you know. Uh, and it, you might develop something that makes you better because of it. And I adopted that philosophy when I started working uh, for newspapers because I had a, I'd have editors and they say oh, you can't do this you can't do that mm-hmm. instead of I wouldn't get mad about it I just go okay all right I take them you know take their wisdom I, I'm working for them and then I figure out what's what's a better way of doing what I want to do here uh, that they will accept I think it makes you better and it it certainly it makes for a, a better working environment if you're that kind of person instead of a guy who's constantly complaining. Right. Which, re- which reminds me of a Lou Holtz uh, uh, quote. He said, um, don't complain because 90, so don't complain about your problems because 90% of the people that, that you talk to about it don't care. And the other 10% are glad that you have the problem. Right. So that's good. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's, that is true. The, the, the thing that, uh, that kind of drove that home for me was when I was in school and we got to a subject, got to a chapter in one of my social studies books. I don't even remember how, but the teacher was talking about uh, the idea of a personal fable. Um, And a personal fable is the belief that we have that other people are watching us, that other people are paying attention to Mm -hmm to us and and like they they notice that we're wearing the same shirt that we wore yesterday and they notice if our you know that our cowlick is sticking up in the back and they notice that that we're you know they just the the people are just noticing us and paying attention and he said it's it's not true i mean yeah if you go in and you if you run into the store and you start kicking over shelves and setting stuff on fire yeah people are going to notice you but if you're just a if you're just a citizen going about your business, people are not paying any attention to you, um, and that kind of stuck with me, and I and it still sticks with me. I when I'm when I'm thinking about uh, like running out the door, you know, to go to, to to run an errand or something like that, I I, I think about 
you know, or just before I look in the mirror and, and check my shirt, it's like, as long as I'm wearing clothes or something, I'm just going to go run the errand because yeah. nobody's going to look, nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody, nobody nobody's cares. paying any attention to me. Um, yeah. And, and if they are paying attention to me, it means I'm probably being, I'm probably drawing attention to myself, which is an ego problem as well you know you're not supposed to you're not supposed to try to be the center of attention and yeah. so yeah yeah i don't know uh archie uh, said again maybe jacob learned that hard working hard for what you want is better than stealing it um that's why he worked so hard for two wives later on you know uh he was deceptive in getting the blessing and then he gets deceived later on <laughs> it's because it kind of came back to bite him. He also got deceived by his uh, sons, just like he deceived yes. his father. His sons deceived yes. him. So, so the question question here is: that a family trait? Is that is that a, uh, something in the genes that just gets passed on? And uh, but yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It just it just keeps going on and on. Well, if I you're if you're gonna be the the, the the things about the Bible that are interesting to me are you've got these patriarchal stories, you've got the, the superstars in the Bible, and it always shows them, you know, in their flawed reality. It doesn't, you would think that Abraham and Jacob and Esau, Isaac, all of these guys that would be, you know, they would be elevated to like a near superhuman status. Um, <clears throat> that's what the Greeks did with their gods. Mm -hmm. their, their gods mm -hmm. were like, they were like these, these incredible uh, beings, but the people in the Bible are are not. They don't always show. They they always lack faith. They they lack integrity. Yeah. They, you know, they're dishonest. They're selfish. They're uh, short sighted. Very flawed. They, yeah. Very flawed. All of them. Which uh, to me is another proof that the Bible's true. If you were trying to make all this stuff up, you wouldn't make the the heroes so flawed, but right. they are really flawed. And in our text in, in verse 30, I think it's interesting. It says, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and almost before Jacob had left, his father uh, Esau returned from the hunt. I mean, it's almost like a movie, the timing of it. He right. just finished. Jacob's now just getting ready to leave the room and in walks Isaac. I mean, Esau, and it's right. like, Oh, and uh, oh, I didn't. I bet that was an, soon. But that was an awkward moment. But you know, the whole time that they're, you know, that uh, Rebecca's fixing the meal, didn't they know how Esau was going to respond when he gets back? I mean, didn't were they just thinking that he won't? Oh, he won't care. Uh, obviously, he got pretty Maybe. upset about it. Maybe I don't he know. didn't really he, care about his birthright very much. He didn't. So I, I he didn't it's before. Possible that they might have. But it seemed him. like it seemed like this one. He he wanted this, you know. And I don't know. I think a lot of times we we uh, we hope people forget, you know. And, mm -hmm. and in this case, maybe he was hoping that Jacob would forget that it was just a pot of stew. I mean, nobody takes that seriously. You didn't really think I was serious when I said I was going to give up my birthright for for. Right. A bowl of soup, you know that. That's the way people try to justify it. Well, sure, but it's again, it's that mentality that says, "Yeah, well, you know, I, I take it back. I, I don't. Yeah, yeah it, that was I, I acted rashly. So just, you know, just just give it back to me. It, it's the idea yeah. that none of my decisions are really permanent. That it, it's yeah. everything is liquid and flexible, and and you'll just. Yeah, every basically you think that the universe is going to conform to your will you're going to you can behave however you want do whatever you want say whatever you want mm -hmm. and everybody will just make allowances for you um, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work that way no it doesn't yeah and he did weep about it I mean he got upset um, so he uh, he asks Esau, Esau asks Isaac for a blessing. And he goes, well, I don't, don't have any more blessings. He goes, Surely you got to have another blessing. Nope, I already gave it to your brother. Well, something. 
So he says, okay, yeah. <laughs> he gives him, and he gives him this kind of weak, lame blessing about <laughs> you're going to live away from the richness of the earth and away from the dew of the heaven. You'll live by the sword and you'll serve your brother. Um, and he goes, and if you decide to break free, if you decide to break free, you will shake his yoke from your neck. Um, and so he... And I think if I'm Esau, then best. I go, I think I, if I'm Esau, I go... <laughs> You're kidding me. That's it. That's just, all. Just go I ahead get. and keep it. I'm sorry. Just keep it. You don't need to. Uh, no. So he, uh, so Esau uh, hated Jacob after that, which is um, also a, a typical thing from somebody who is uh, short-sighted and impulsive. Short-sighted mm. and impulsive people uh, often are angry at other people for the consequences of, of their own rash decision making. You know, mm -hmm. they're, these are people. Road rage is uh, is the yeah. result of of short-sighted, rash people. You know, who take who are personally offended by things that are not personal that happen on the right. interstate you know people right. people cut you right. off people don't know how to merge nobody knows how to merge the only the only person yeah. on the road who knows how to merge is me no none of yeah. the rest of you know how to merge <laughs> and and so when somebody merges and they're wrong if you if you take that personally if you take that as a personal affront if they are mm -hmm. that, that's what leads to road rage and it's irrational right, right. Right. But that's that's basically what Esau was doing. It was road rage. He was yeah. you gave your birth right away. You gave it away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and on top of that, God wanted Jacob. You know, he wanted your brother to have this anyway. And whether or not Esau knew that, I mean, who knows? But the fact is that it was it was done and he blamed Jacob for acting on something that was kind of his fault. Yeah, um, it was. You're right. So I think it's interesting in verse 45, well, in verse 44, where Rebecca tells Jacob to go to her brother and stay there. She says, stay there uh, with him until your brother cools off when he calms down and forgets what you have done to them. Wait a minute. I uh -huh. thought you were in on this, Mom. Right. You, you were the one who came up with the idea. I. Right. Uh, what happened to the we here? What you have done to him? As if okay. he's going to forget. As if he's going to like... <laughs> you know, like it, it is interesting. He's gonna, it is interesting, come, though. Why is it that I don't have the birthright anymore? What happened? I don't I don't remember. I don't know. It's all water under the bridge. I don't know. I think it is, it's interesting, and Christine pointed it out, that when we see their reunion later on, I mean, it's... it's it. You, Jacob is scared to death. But mm -hmm. Esau assures him, "I'm not going to kill you." You know, I well, I don't want to. Don't I don't want to be a spoiler alert here, but uh, but I think Too that late. you're going to see that verse six. So we kind of talked about this when we first read it. But uh, then Rebecca said, "Isaac, I am sick and tired of these local these Hittite local women." Hittite women. <laughs> oh, I wish I had a nickel for every time I've said that. Wow. Well, I'm sick of these local uh, Hittites. And of course, uh, Esau is married to two of them. And so, mm -hmm. and in we, the last verse of last week in verse 20, in chapter 26, it said that uh, those two women made Isaac and Rebecca miserable. This is it. So, yeah, this is, they, they, we finish up the last two chapters with mentions about yeah. those Hittite women. <laughs> um, so, Wow, it, it, we we touched on it briefly last week, but the idea of um, of inclusiveness—that's uh, not the right word—but uh, but basically mixing mixing cultures, being yeah. uh, being trying trying to do life together with people who are who are going in a different yeah. direction. Um, it just doesn't work out, and. We have a, a a lot of call in church. At least my church experience has been that it's a Christian's obligation to to seek out 
intentionally people who think differently than you do. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what we're that's what we're told to do. Our job, our job is to go out and intentionally become involved with people who have a different have a different ideology, a different religion, a different perspective with the idea of, of evangelizing them. That's what we're told. Exactly. You go out, you you mix with those people and then you evangelize them. And I think I, I think it is prudent to at least mention that there comes a point where you have to have some standards, boundaries, uh, limitations on what you're going to mm -hmm. do for mm -hmm. the evangelism of other people, because it's mm -hmm. it, it, like like this, the, those local Hittite women will ruin your life if you uh, right. if you allow them to become integrated completely in your family, you've got to keep you got to keep pagans at a distance until they yeah. become believers and until then they become believers yeah you, you're you're asking for trouble if you're marrying somebody of a different faith somebody that you're not um, you know the dating process should be one where you're um you're getting these things sorted out and before you ever step into marriage and you shouldn't i i would advise my kids or I advise my kids and I advise my grandkids when they get a little older to not even date somebody who's not a believer. Now I will preface that by saying that when I first started dating my wife, she wasn't a believer, but I took her to church and she got saved. And then, you know, then uh, the romance started after that. But um, mm -hmm. I liked her. We had a lot in common, but, uh, at the same time, it, this was something that I would talk to her about, and then we go to church, and mm -hmm. and so, you know, if that's that should be you know your goal, but if it's a, love's a dangerous thing because you don't, I mean, you can fall in love with just about anybody, but you do have to start thinking about the future, and what's the future look like with this person if they're not a believer? Uh, you're just asking for a world of hurt. You know, at the same time, the, the problems that we have in our country are the United States is supposed to be a melting pot of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we have all these different cultures coming in here. Here's the problem, though. If you come to America and, and you are holding on to a different culture and, and you even describe yourself as a hyphenated American, well, then you, you're not an, really an American. American is what you are, and you... There should be an assimilation. If you come here, you want to be here. You love this country. You forsake you know, your former country. It's not that you are this and that. You are you become an American, just the same way as a, you know becoming a Christian. You forsake everything else, and you're following Christ now. You can't. I can't be a Muslim worshiper and following Christ. You can't do both. You you got to pick one. And the same thing when it, when it comes to America, when we have people who you know, they maintain their, you know, their, uh, what they hold on to wherever they came from. They came here for economic benefit, but they want to hold on to that. And then they, they start in, in the case of, uh, some people, I, uh, Ilan Omar comes here from Sudan, I think, or yeah, anyway. And a whole bunch of those people all settle in Minnesota Mm -hmm. And so much so that they, when they vote, they're filling the ballot boxes with, you know, their vote for the, the Somali or whatever it is. Is it Somalia she's from or Sudan? I don't know. I can't remember which one. It starts with an S. Mm -hmm. And so she's going to be in Congress from now on. She hates us. She hates the country. She wants to, you know, she wants to tear down all the systems and start over. You know, the, 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 she's the big defund the police person. And, and she talks about uh, the system, systemic racism that's in the system all the time. Come on. You, you, what you're doing is because you don't love this country, you're trying to change it into what you came from. And there's a reason you came from that country. It, it was terrible. And so you came here. I'm, I know I'm getting very political here, but I, what I'm saying is what well, goes along with what you're saying, John, is that there needs to be some assimilation. There needs to be um, some conformity. Uh, is it the book of? Absolutely. Is it Somalia. the book of? 
yeah, I'm trying to think. Is it Esther or is it uh, Book of Ruth? It's the Book of Ruth, Somalia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the Book of Ruth, um, where that gal says to her mother-in-law, my God, your God is my God. Your, I'm going to go where you country go. Is my, and I'm going to go where you go. That's a person who's following the Lord. And, and you know, we, we need more of that. Well, you said uh, you referenced to the melting pot. And that's what, what happens in a melting pot is that the things that go into it melt and yeah. come together. I mean, things don't go into a melting pot and stay in their original form and shape. You know, exactly. just rattle around. It, they they lose their they lose their identity, and their identity yeah. becomes, you know, yeah. the the amalgamation, the uh, the mixture, um, and and that is that is yeah. Ruth and Naomi, Christine, understand. Christine, it's important uh, to understand that when you're <clears throat> when you are getting the idea of that you're going to start a family. That you're gonna yeah. that you're gonna put a that you're gonna put a family together, and one of the reasons that we don't do families well in America anymore is because we don't understand that you're that you that you melt together. Uh, the Bible says that the man and woman become one flesh. You know that they become they they're a one person now, and mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you add the children to that, and they they become part of the family. They they it, it's all it's all melted together all of those individuals become part of a you know of, of a group and the i think we've talked about this before too that the the lens through which you viewed the rest of the culture in in the bible the bible is is about the family the patriarchal unit you know the yeah. mother the father at the head and then the mother mm -hmm. underneath the matriarch and then the children that was how they navigated throughout through the culture was it wasn't it wasn't individual people out making their way trying to figure things out the family navigated the culture together and so right. if it, it, we don't have that now we've got it we've got a, yeah. a whole bunch of individual people who are asserting their individuality doing what's best for them doing what's right for them and they have no regard for the other people in the family um, Show what uh, Marilyn Templeton just said. I think that she's right. You know, it used to be the melting pot, but now it's changed to we're a salad bowl. <laughs> See, that's not that's the same right. thing. <laughs> it's not the same that's thing. So same a thing. salad bowl. But you know what she's saying is that yeah, the, the salad bowl. <laughs> you got all these different parts that right. don't go together, and right. uh, and that's you're right. That's never what do. we what we have. And so they never do unless you put that it, salad. It would be great if, if we if it'd be great if we really were a melting pot because then we would be getting along with some kind of unity. But as long as we're well, divided, if you, if you you if you want to use the salad analogy, then we would be the Cuisinart. That would be ideal. <laughs> well, you put it in there and you yeah. grind everything up. So grind it's, it up. Yeah, it's not separatable anymore. Yeah. So yeah. America would not be. Yeah, the salad bowl is not a good analogy, but it, it is it is accurate. That is that is what we have become. I, that, I think that was why she said that it, it's mm -hmm. accurate. We're not a melting pot anymore. We're a salad bowl, and salads mm -hmm. don't really mix. We got all these different well, parts going together. It's it's tough. It's tough to have a uh, when, when you realize that you are that that you are losing your individual identity. Um, the, the way it currently stands, but your identity now becomes, it, it's some, it's part of that family. It's part of that family. You, you mm. become, um, you become somebody's husband or wife, you become a mother or a father, uh, and then you're a sister or a brother, but, and you're all of these things simultaneously and your individuality is, is understood through that, um, through those relationships. And we just don't value those relationships anymore. We, we value, we're more like Esau, you know, we, we yeah. do what we want right now to get what we, to get our bowl of soup right now, because that's going to make us happy. And it doesn't exactly. matter what God's plan is. It doesn't matter what my mother wants, what my father wants. It doesn't matter how my brothers and sisters are affected. I, I'm going to get what I want right now. And, um, and that's why things are a mess. It, it didn't work out for Isaac's family, and it doesn't work out for us today either. 
Uh, someone just texted me a, a, an alert about the war in Ukraine right now. And supposedly, and I don't have this verified, but uh, Russian forces have attacked a nuclear plant and there's, it, there's been an explosion. Um, but this is breaking news. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's early and the, the details m might change. I don't know, but things are, are getting going from bad to worse over there. And we need to pray for them as we leave the show today, tonight, I think, uh, pray for, there's a lot of Christians in Ukraine. I've, I heard, uh, John MacArthur talking about, it. he's been over there several times in the past several years and, and they have trained like 2000 pastors in Ukraine. And there's a lot of believers there and this is a tough situation. And I also see, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of people out there talking about end time stuff that, that, uh, this is, um, this is not mentioned in prophecy, but this could be leading to fulfillment of prophecy and specifically Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I encourage you to go read that. Uh, but, um, tonight I went through some of my old cartoons of, of, uh, Vladimir Putin and put them together in a little gallery that I put in my newsletter. So if you get my newsletter tomorrow or Wednesday, you'll see it. And, uh, going back into the Obama administration, I drew several cartoons where Putin was talking about invading Ukraine back then. Mm -hmm. I, I'd forgotten it, but I drew cartoons about it. I mean, this is not a brand new thing. This has been percolating for years. Right. And he, and he's made con Putin's made comments that he's not going to stop. He's going to keep moving on. And this is some weird times that we're living in, but, and you know, there's been wars all over the place all the time, but now we're over there in an area that's getting closer and closer to, the, to Israel. And Israel is the center of history it is the center of the world attention and when christ returns and sets up his kingdom he will rule and reign from jerusalem mm -hmm. but uh anyway it's uh, oh so ray bates says if you're not subscribed to my newsletter you should be and it, you can go subscribe at garyvarvel.com mm -hmm. i'm looking for that um yeah i would the the thing that we definitely have to pray. We, de we should always be praying that, that God would give us wisdom and that God would have his, um, you know, have his hand on all of our world situations. Uh, at the same time, I think it's also important to keep in the back of our heads that uh, the only thing we actually know about what's going on in the world is what's fed to us through the various media streams. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, most of them have proven to be pretty unreliable and it, yeah, yeah. I, I I'm suspicious uh, of the, the people who are who have told me that I'm that I have to wear a mask and I have to get vaccinated and uh, and I'm I'm hateful if I think that boys can't be girls and girls can't be boys these are all the same <laughs> right. people that are now telling me how I'm supposed to feel about Russia invading Ukraine and I'm just a little I'm just a little uncertain that uh that they're telling me the the straight up true story you know yeah exactly matt walsh kind of said something similar to that this past week uh, on twitter that he doesn't trust anybody everything mm -hmm. he reads he just questions anymore it's mm -hmm. it's hard to get it's hard to know what to trust well i gotta go so let's uh let's pray and uh, pray specific i'm gonna pray specifically for ukraine okay father in heaven i thank you for the study tonight thank you for uh conversation that we had here thank you for the input from people who are watching but our hearts go out to the people of ukraine and and specifically i think about uh, the believers who were there and suffering through all of this i pray that you would give your divine protection over them give them wisdom about what you would have them to do help those who are fighting for their own home and lord we we don't know what's going on in the hearts of uh the, the Russian soldiers or even in, in, in Putin, but I pray that you, your will would be done there and that uh, you would be glorified and pray that, uh, for a miraculous, uh, salvation of people, uh, who are suffering right now. 
Um, we love you and we thank you that you have loved us and have offered us eternal life in Jesus Christ. And we uh, ask for anybody who'd be listening tonight that they, if they have not made Christ their Savior, that they would do that even tonight. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, Father, we're thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. We'll see you next week. See you next time.